Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of The Island Show, part of the Nothing Exempt Podcast Network. And in this one, we have a um, very interesting island. And let us know if I've made a lot of changes to improve the sound quality of the show. So uh, if, if you've noticed the improvements, uh, please uh, follow up with me. But when it comes to this island, it's the Isle of Man, which is the home of the Manx people in the Irish Sea. So, Brian, tell us about some of the geographical basics about the Isle of Man to set things up. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, if you want to reach out to Nick, go to his Twitter, yell at him, or reach us on Nothing Exempt on Twitter. Uh, anyways, the Isle of Man is one of the neatest places that I think I've ever researched and definitely never been to, but would totally go. So I'll answer that question we usually answer at the end and say, yes, I would go to the Isle of Man. Just because it's in such a unique place, it's kind of a smallish island. It's found in between Wales, Scotland, and I and Ireland in the sea, in the middle of all between all of that. It's thirty miles long by twenty miles wide, and it's kind of at an angle. It's the long axis is kind of northeast to southwest if you look at it. Uh, it's it's not actually officially part of the United Kingdom but it's a crown possession and it's self-governing in its internal affairs. And uh, it's under the supervision of the British home office. The, the climate on the Island is fairly similar to what I would expect for the other islands. Uh, as far as differences, it, it gets uh, an average of 140 rainy days a year. So it seems very much like England. It's a fairly green place with a, a fair amount of drizzle, not a lot of snow, because it's right on the ocean. It's average high in summers, about 65 degrees F. It's average low in winters, about 18 degrees. Oh, that's sorry, that's the record low. 40, yeah. 40 degrees is the average low. And it seems like a beautiful, relatively flat place to go. It sounds like the climate's very similar to like Seattle. Yeah, or London. Or Ireland. I mean, as far from here, even though I've been there, I'm not educated enough to know why or how it's different across the aisles. They seem very similar. I've heard Ireland gets more rain, but. Any unique natural features on the island? Nothing that pops up when you go searching for them. Did you find any waterfalls or anything that you found, Nick? I didn't see anything unique. Yeah. There's a few cliffs, maybe, but I don't think that's what really is what makes Isle of Man interesting. Uh, in terms of how to get there, it's not as straightforward as you think it would be. I mean, if you live in the British Isles, pretty much every major city in the UK you could fly there from. Fly from Belfast, Manchester, Liverpool, Edinburgh, um, or Edinburgh, I think is how they pronounce it over there, and London. But with from London, you only could fly from like the smaller airports in London, like Gatwick and South End and London City and not Heathrow, which is the common airport that if you're flying for, to the UK from outside of Europe, especially for American tourists, you usually go to Heathrow. So if you're going to go to the Isle of Man, you're going to have to connect overland to a different airport within London. So, I mean, if I was going to visit, you probably ought to stay a day or in London, maybe to catch up on jet lag and have a little bit of a break between your flights and then maybe go to the Isle of Man the next day, because you're going to have to switch airports anyway. Oh, you might. I won't. I could fly straight to Gatwick from Denver, nonstop. Can you fly straight from Gatwick to Los Angeles? I, I don't know. I, I don't but know. You can, but you can go nonstop Gatwick a lot of places, because Norwegian flies out, out of there, which okay. I really I really enjoyed Norwegian Air. Even economy class, it's not a budget airline that compares with Spirit or Ryanair or other really budget airlines. It's it's fairly nice. Have you flown a Ryanair flight? Yeah, I've been on a Ryanair flight. I've been on a Spirit flight. I've been on Frontier. Yeah, where did you uh, go on a Ryanair flight from? Because I don't. It, I, I thought you haven't done that much European travel. No, they had some flight in America. I'm fairly sure I was on a Ryanair flight, but. I can't remember where I was flying to or from, probably to or from Denver. Yeah. I mean, Ryanair flights, I've done them when I lived in Europe. They're not terrible in terms of the actual experience on the flight. But 
the problem with them is they often go to airports that are way out of the way to where you actually want to go. Like if you, like if you're flying to Paris, they'll pick the most out of the way airport to land because there's cheaper landing fees. As an example, so you got to be like, mindful of that. Yeah, like Norwegian is the same thing, Gatwick Airport. Yeah. Um. So that's um. I know we kind of got off topic there, but that's yeah. Why don't you why don't, why don't you go back and talk about the demographics? Okay, there's about eighty six thousand people in the Isle of Man, population wise, and it's uh pop, it's it's not that big of an island, so it's only about two hundred twenty square miles. It's kind of similar in size to um like a suburb, a Los Angeles suburb, both in population and and land wise. Uh, it's uh, mostly the, the the main demographics there in terms of national origin groups are people from other parts of the British Isles. Uh, you have Manx, which are the term like of the Isle of Man, people who've, per- who've been Manx for generations since the Norse days. That's 15%. And you have about 60% of British her- heritage, 10% Irish. 7% South African, 5% Australian, and 3% American. Those And then they're, and like 8.5% others. So that's kind of the demographics. It's a lot of English-speaking peoples. Uh, they have a gen, slight gender imbalance with more men than women there. And religious-wise, it's mostly Protestant Christians. Okay, and if we're going to talk about the people, I can say that I've done a bit of reading about what they eat and do and what kind of people they are. And there's there's a lot of farming that goes on, agriculture, uh, ra- raising of sheep. And if, if you look at the national dish, dish of the country, it says spuds and heron, which I assume is pronounced different, a slight accent, but it's boiled potatoes and herring. And that sounds like a terrible description of a meal. I, I hope it's better than it sounds. Well, English food doesn't have the best, or, or British food, it doesn't have the best reputation globally. I, I found that when I was there, there, there's a lot of variety in different types of things. And it's, it seems just like from a globalist perspective, not super different from America. There's Chinese food, a lot of Indian food. There's, you know, different chains of different kinds of things over there. There's Pizza Hut everywhere. K- KFC's all over the place. Yeah, but I mean, I'm talking about actual, like, native British like, dishes. Yeah, the boiled potatoes and herring doesn't sound great to me. But if you look at what's available, uh, like, late night food there would be uh, fish and chips or chips, chips, cheese, and gravy. And that's, that's what they call French fries. So it, it seems like a very British type of uh, cuisine. Uh, they, they obviously eat a lot of seafood. They're surrounded by the ocean. Crab, lobster, scallops, everything's fished from the Isle of Man. All of those, all the local fisheries uh, in the Isle of Man provide fresh seafood, and, and that's one of their main exports, uh, along with the agriculture, cattle, sheep, pigs, poultry, and, and farmed uh, agriculture. Uh, and also they make a lot of cheese on the island over 578 tons a year of cheese which is a lot and then there's all there's a note here about their beer and whiskey but i feel like that's true of everywhere in england and the uk and scotland and everywhere it's gonna everyone's gonna talk about their beer and whiskey <laughs> uh, it's the same in america a lot of places in america are going to talk about their beer and whiskey <laughs> Okay, right. Nick, go. What's right. what's what's next for you? Well, as you're supposed to go over history. Oh, so I just jump straight into history. Yeah. We can talk about the history. Uh, they they have a lot of Neolithic peoples that lived there. Uh, a lot of the history is gone, and we we see ruins that have been been uh, excavated and studied. Then the Romans came, and they had a time or two with the vikings it looks like in 1290 edward the first of scotland took possession of man and it remained there back and forth over 
with Robert Bruce taking it back. So it's been fought over, but it's been an English possession most of the last thousand years. Um, as there's 250 historic sites and registered bu- buildings, you you can go look at the remnants of the Celtic times, Norse times. It, it's it's got a ton of history, a lot more than anywhere in America does. That's for sure. All right. In terms of like its governance, what's most notable about Isle of Man governance is that they claim to have the world's oldest continuing parliament, which they call Tinwald. It's according to Manx, um, the Manx tradition, it has been going on since 979 AD, which is over a thousand years. Uh, Historians may argue that the origin was much later than that, but it's really unknown when they really officially got started with it. So I'll just use 979 for the purposes of this show. Um, also, it's a lot, their, their general, their politics are a lot less partisan than other parts of the UK. They don't participate in things like Brexit because they're technically not part of the United Kingdom. So they just really worry more about domestic affairs. They have three part political parties, but again, it's generally po- political candidates that are run um, on a more nonpartisan, uh, unaffiliated basis. And in terms of business, their economy, similar to a lot of other small, well-developed islands, is very prosperous, but it also works on a lot of like loopholes that bigger countries regulate or out of the system. Like The Isle of Man has set up its business laws to be very favorable for insurance companies. In fact, like revenue from insurance-related activities is 17% of the Isle of Man's GDP, and another 17% of its GDP is... Uh, from online um, gambling. Isle of Man is generally a low tax economy. There's no capital gains tax, wealth tax, or stamp duties or inheritance taxes. The top income tax rate is 20%. And they have a hard tax cap where the the maximum amount any individual would pay in tax is 125,000 pounds or 250,000 pounds if you're a couple and have you choose to have your income jointly assessed. yeah, and personal um, income is taxed on a worldwide basis there. That means even if you earn it outside of – it's like America in that way. Even if you earn it outside of, um, of, of, of the Isle of Man, it still counts as Isle of Man tax. And, uh, yeah, they have no corporate income tax either, um, except for the retail sector, which is if a retail business has about over 500000 um in revenue or a bank has more than 500,000 in revenue, they have to, they only get taxed at 10%. So it looks like it's a very favorable um, business and they have a big part of their government is also financed by a lottery. The Isle of Man has a custom union with the UK. Uh, They also try to promote having films there through financial support and tax breaks. They're actually trying to get more aggressively into things such as esports too. Uh, and they finance a lot of their revenue from a, from a lottery as, as well. So it's a pretty um, free market type place. Uh, and it's not quite like this level of tax haven to say like the Cayman Islands, but it's still much more favorable than any larger developed nation. Can you, oh, yeah. descri- can you describe what the class of people is? is who would move to the Isle of Man and uh, how do they compare with the mainlanders? Um, I mean, the average income there is quite high. It's about $86,000 a year, which is similar to um, the, like the, uh, similar places such as like the Cayman Islands and uh, like wealthier suburbs in America, such as Newport Beach and Greenwich, Connecticut. So... I mean, I think it would be a very attractive place for retirees um, and people who work in the industries that I mentioned uh, previously. I mean, I don't. So, so the really income a banking center, though. But the, so the income's very high. Yeah. And there's forty or I don't know how many millions of people on the British Isles. There's about at least 60, 70 million people. Seventy million people. You'd think that. Uh, it would be a very 
like popular place to try to get to move to because there's there's so few people there. Yeah, there's 60 million people on Great Britain, uh, and there's all there's only 90,000 people on, on across across the channel. There's only 90,000 people, so a very if even if it's a the interest interest is very low, you're still going to get a lot of demand to try to move there. If, well, it's, if, I don't if know it, if they have a lot of high skilled jobs that a younger person would move there for. Or, or, or they don't really have any big cities. A lot of people like living in big cities. The biggest city on the island is their capital, Douglas, which is 27,000 people. And then the next biggest city is a suburb, a village called Anchan with 9,000 people. Well, I guess not all of us are in love with islands, but I'm sure that there's are a lot of people like us that would be interested in that. I mean, if I, was, if I was a British person... And I was married and I wanted, and I had a business that wasn't reliant on me having to talk to people on a daily basis. I would live on the Isle of Man. I could fly to London if I had to meet with a client. It's not that far away. Yeah, I'm attracted to the the island life like that. I would be on board with doing something like that too. And it's not like it's in the middle of nowhere. It's not like no, Hawaii, you're where you have to fly five hours to get anywhere. No, you get to have the island experience, but be semi separated from all the people. I wonder what the housing prices are like. I probably should have done some research on that before doing this show. Because if it well, while while you're doing that, I can tell you what you would do on the island. Okay. If if you go to, um, the government website to come visit the Isle of Man. It has a quote from National Geographic. So everybody buckle up. It says the dramatic cliffside views, Viking and medieval castle ruins, kaleidoscopic sunsets, and uber fresh seafood. Is it overkill to have some kippers, salmon, and scallops every single day? You should fill a fantastic week. That's the quote they have from... Apparently, someone in National Geographic wrote that, and they put plaster that on their website, all big. So, yeah, you could go see some castles on the beach. Take you could take a railroad a, a railroad journey through the island, seeing the vistas, and you could go on a boat and go fishing, or go look at wildlife while watching. And at night, you can go to a different bar and find different whiskeys or a different brewery. It, it could be a great experience for you if you're into any of those things. And, yeah. and for family, fa- wait, 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 one last thing for family attractions, the largest working water wheel in the world is on the Isle of Man, according to the government website. So. I mean, you're as a father, Brian, would, wouldn't you feel like your kids get bored living on the Isle of Man? Kids are so easily entertained by other kids. The boy like a- teenagers. I'm not. Uh, there's 14 person cities where I would agree with you, Nick. But this is we're talking 90,000 people, with Ireland and the UK close by for weekend trips. I mean, teenagers get bored in like places like Dana Point and um, Aliso Viejo, or I don't really know what the equivalent of that would be in Denver. But so it sounds like their problem that uh, you can deal with. I'm just saying, like. I looked up the housing market. It's not that expensive, actually. The average property in the Isle of Man is about 248,000 pounds, which is 322,000 US dollars. Um, yeah, and if you're if the if the per capita is 90k, if you could make that, then that's under four times your income. That's yeah. achievable. It says it's only the only age group that has a hard time affording it is uh, under 25. Which they have a hard time affording property anywhere. And yeah, I mean, it says like the average wage is lower than the GB per capita. The average wage is um, is closer to $48,000 per year. But that's the same like in America. Like the average wage is much lower than its GB per capita. So there is some degree of, in- like, of incomes being skewed to the right with a lot of higher income people in the Isle of Man, but for how wealthy this place is, that's very reasonable housing price. 
it's similar to about Denver, right? Oh, Den Denver has so much diversity. There's three hundred thousand dollar houses and there's three million dollar houses. Yeah, but I'm talking about like for your average property price in Denver. I think the average property price in the city of Denver is probably five hundred plus thousand dollars. Really? It's that high? But you can go to any suburb and it'll drop a lot, or you can go to another suburb and it'll be eight fifty. Is, there's a there's a ton of variation in this area. Yes, yeah, so city I mean, by state. yeah, I mean, I think it's yeah. I think the only thing I'd be worried about is if I had a family and my kids might not have much to do because there's not that many big city amenities. Like, I don't think there's like a major amusement park on the Isle of Man. There's no professional sports other than a motorcycle race that happens once every year, which is supposed to be one of the most wild and dangerous um, motorcycle races in the world, the Isle of Man TT. Uh, and, uh, there, and a lot of other th like things that people take for granted who live in major metro areas. Yeah, I take for granted Costco. I'd have to give that up pro probably. Yeah, I don't think they have Costco on the island of man. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, so, since you are, well, okay, so you, I mean, if you had a more mobile, geographically mobile job, would you consider like living in different places with your kids, like these islands or is stability more important in terms of geographic um, upbringing? Honestly, Nick, I think both my wife and I go back and forth on what we would do. Like we have desires for both things. Like it would be fun to, and we are homeschooling our kids. It would be fun to be able to travel around and go live a year here and live there or if this island show was funded by George Soros and we could just go week by week or month by month on different islands, I think that we both want, would love that. But at the same time, you're right, that stability and relationships locally are important. They're important to have a foundation of people who are in your life for when things happen in life, uh, to support you when you have new kids or, you know, something, you know, like there's, there's a lot of benefits to having a network. So I'd say both and that I don't know which way we would, you know, we kind of go both ways. Yeah. I mean, I, you feel, up, you feel the same? No, I'd actually be against like, once I have kids, I'm staying put for 20 years. At least yeah, because it, it's it's super nice to have long term relationships and foundations and family ties. Well, I think it's for children's psychological development. I moved around a lot, relatively, and I know a lot of other people who did, and it has an effect. It makes it hard later in life to have real close ties with people, and you have you feel do a little bit more disconnected to everything. At least I did. I moved around. I lived, I went to four schools in a five year period in my early teens. And look at you, Nick. Total failure in life. And it's all because of that. I'm not a failure in life, but like, it's not like my example. I have my, my sister who has a more stable, um, like, community growing up. And yeah, she's still basically her whole social life. Not all of it. Outside of her coworkers is basically people who she grew up with, including her husband. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just different approaches to things, I guess. People, I know a lot of people, a lot of my friends are people who grew up like me, who moved around a lot and have like have lived a lot of different places. I lived a lot of places in my early 20s too. And you have a nice network when you go around the world, but you just have less... You just you have less close ties at home, which is pluses and minuses to that. So it's not I'm not saying it's necessarily a good or a bad thing. Yeah, well this show got real deep. If you <laughs> hey, if you guys are listening and you want to add to this conversation, we invite you to. Hey, if you've been like an army brat and you've lived in twenty places in twenty years, come on the show. Let's talk about it. That sounds like a great episode to talk to you about. Yeah, but if like, if if you've been if if you haven't gone on an airplane before or ever flown and you're like forty, that'd also be an interesting conversation. I saw some ridiculous stat that like over ten percent of Americans have never left their home state. Yeah, 
Yeah, that does sound ridiculous unless you're including people who are under 18. Then I can believe it. Yeah, I mean they're probably who... they're probably 10% of the population and you know, I didn't get on my first plane until I was 14. I don't even remember when I went on my first plane. I went to Hawaii one before I was even able to talk. Same with Houston. I don't think my mother drive to those places. I've, no, I've heard that the drive to Hawaii is a difficult one to make. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so would I visit the Isle of Man? Maybe eventually. It's not on the top of my list, but that's just because I'm really not that interested in going to the British, back to the British Isles generally. But it's one of the it's one of the top places I want to go within the British Isles. I I think that there's a good chance I'll go back to the British Isles in my just for work in the next year or two. But I'm not going to go on a family trip there probably. And so how do you swing going to the Brit to the Isle of Man on a work trip? I don't know about that. You I guess I could do the the weekend before or the weekend after I could go by myself, but then if I'm leaving my wife and kids behind I'm yeah. sure they're not on board with that. So yeah, you probably gotta... just not on the radar of things I can do, but it's something I would like to do. I would love to go visit the Isle of Man. You got to find a client who's on the Isle of Man. Yeah, we need. I need to go talk to the sales guys and say, target customers in aerospace on the Isle of Man. <laughs> I wonder how many aerospace <laughs> professionals are on the Isle of Man. I don't think there's that many. If we go talk to go talk to uh, the big number one and two customers and be like, open up an engineering office there, please. I mean, I think you could get engineers to aerospace engineers to live on the Isle of Man. I agree. Yeah, but this it's a long shot. I think there's a very small chance of me visiting these this island in particular. But I, I would I'll, like to. I don't know. I think when I'm like in my sixties. Like I'm old enough that I'm done with a lot of my career goals, but not too old to travel. I might just spend a year going to all the islands that we talk about on this show. Nick, go get George Soros or someone to to fund this show, to just let us go travel around to islands and do the show. I'm on board with that plan. Yeah, I mean, if anybody's going to be funding it, it'll probably be me when my business gets grows. <laughs> Yeah, well, I wish you all the success in the world so we can go do that because that sounds like a blast. Yeah, so um, that's all I have to really say. We kind of got a little off topic there, but I think it's one of our better island shows. Yeah, I think so too. So if you guys are listening and you want to reach out to us, suggest a new show or whatever, you could go to reddit.com, find our subreddit, Nothing Exempt, post there, or like I said at the beginning of the show, go to Twitter and reach us at Nothing Exempt. If uh, you like the show, we'd appreciate a review on iTunes, maybe a thumbs up. I know it doesn't matter. And uh, yeah, otherwise, we look forward to the next show and, and talking to you guys soon. Yeah, we're now on YouTube, by the way. Yeah, we, you, we put audio up on YouTube and Nick and I are talking about what we would like to do for video. If anybody has any experience with uh, like green screen type uh, we'd love to put a map of an island up and then just like silhouette our bodies in over the map or, or something like that. If you have any experience, please reach out to us. We'd, we'd love to hear from you. Okay. Until next time.